Lily. Thank you for joining me on this lovely evening. Um, it's actually not really lovely where I am because it's really rainy, but I hope that, oh, that sucks. <laughs> it's not raining uh, where you are. I would like you first to introduce yourself and just say whatever you want about your general background, whatever you want to, to include. Okay, um, so hi, I'm Lily and I'm a transracial adoptee, so that means that I was born in China and then adopted by a white family and raised by a white family, which, you know, caused a lot of identity issues. And yeah, I've just always had an interest in language and I've really enjoyed writing and reading. And so I guess, I don't know, a bit about my language background is I did the typical like elementary school Spanish classes, but- Oh, you had that in elementary school. Yeah, I only yeah, had that like, like in what high school I think really? elementary school is early. Well, from from what oh, I hear, ours were like once a week. The teacher would come to our class and like we do a little Spanish lesson. I didn't really retain any of it though. Like it was yeah, um, yeah. And high school I took French for a little bit and then I switched to Latin, and I really liked Latin. And then college I was an Italian minor and now I'm learning Chinese. So. It's just been this, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you have like a really good like arc of languages behind you, okay. And may I ask like which state you live in in the United States and like if you've moved around a lot or if you've kind of just stayed in one place? Yeah, so I grew up in Georgia and then I went to college up in Boston and now I'm in Texas for grad school. So kind of all over there too. <laughs> awesome, okay. Okay, very cool, because I, I stayed in Arkansas for pretty much all my life, so um, I've always find that interesting. Um, so yeah, so as you said before, your first language class was really in elementary school, and you said you didn't retain any of it. Um, yeah, so you did pretty much grow up pretty um, monolingual, um, I'm guessing, like most Americans, I guess. Only being, only being able to speak English, how has that, if it has, I guess, influenced your identity, especially as a child, but maybe also thinking back to when you were a child as an adult. Yeah, so my parents, like they signed me up for Chinese class when I was little, but I really wasn't interested in reclaiming my identity at that point. And I really just wanted to fit in with the other kids at my school and none of them were going to Chinese class. It was on Saturday and I was like, when I was supposed to be hanging out with friends and stuff, and so I stopped. But yeah, it's it's definitely weird going through life and having everyone else around you like expecting you to be able to speak a certain language and then you don't. And I don't know, I think one of the like most common microaggressions I get is like, oh, your English is so good. You're so articulate. You're like, you're so good at speaking this. And I'm like, well, it's my first language. So I, I don't know. Yeah, um, but lately, like I've been taking Chinese and it's been really cool, but it also can be kind of embarrassing because as a grad student, I interact with a lot of international Chinese students. And so I try to speak with them and I'm like getting my tones wrong and stuff. And it's hard, but it feels good to actually take that step towards reclaiming part of my identity with so you already had explained a little bit why you decided to learn chinese um mm -hmm. what about maybe give a little bit more detail about the others so maybe after <laughs> spanish <laughs> like why like why right. exactly <laughs> yeah so i wanted to learn french because i was a ballerina and all of ballet is in french and so i was like yeah i want to do that and then i started doing it i was like you know i'm not really feeling this so i switched to latin and i loved latin like I just found it extremely straightforward. You didn't really have to worry about pronunciation because it's a dead language. <laughs> and yeah, I did really well in that. And then it also really helped me on like standardized tests. So I was like, okay, it's a win-win. And then I guess in college, I was kind of on the verge of wanting to learn Chinese, but I was like, you know what? I did Latin, Italian seems like the good next step. And so I really enjoyed that too. And then after college, I stopped with Italian I haven't spoken it in quite some time. And then one of my coworkers, his wife used to teach Mandarin. And so 
she's since stopped but I was like hey would you mind being a private tutor for me I am adopted and I'm trying to learn the language and I'm kind of uncomfortable doing it in a traditional classroom setting but I think I'd be comfortable more one-on-one and so I've been doing that for this is my third year now and I yeah I've really liked it and I think I mean one-on-one is great because you can get so much attention and stuff but yeah that's just been my language journey (laughs) did you think that there was um just speaking of the language classroom so when you were um taking just languages in your school system did you find that there was a lot of diversity in the classroom no i've always been like the only asian in my language classes and I thought it would get better. Well, so high school made sense because I grew up in a very white area. I thought it would get better in college, but then like my Italian class was all (laughs) white kids wanting to learn or already like native speakers who were just trying to get an easy A. And (laughs) then there was me. (laughs) So yeah, not diverse at all. Um, And now I'm in Chinese where it's just me. So (laughs) yeah. yeah. Okay, because I, I had asked that question because I did hear from someone else that um, I guess with the like lower level language classes, they there was more diversity. But as you went up in level, like in your third or fourth year at college, mm-hmm. then it would kind of just trickle down to just like white people. So I was really? kind of interested in that and see just seeing if uh, if anyone else had had that experience. I, I really hadn't thought about this before but now that I'm remembering all of my classes it was definitely all white people the entire time (laughs) I don't know why but yeah (laughs) which language do you think defines you the most according to you it's either gonna be no I think it's gonna be English because like I touched on earlier everyone expects me to either be fluent in Chinese or speak with an accent or something and then I don't and because I speak the way I do people will ask me about my background and then I kind of start identifying myself I'm like well you know I was born in China I was adopted and then I grew up here since I was a baby and so I've only spoken English so yeah in a way English really does identify me because people have so many questions (laughs) which is kind of annoying because I don't ask other people that kind of thing but it is what it is. <laughs> yeah. And like when you got those kinds of questions about your adoption, like especially when you were younger, um, did it like ever like really bother you or were you just like, yeah, it's a, it is how it is. And I'll just say. It would it would irk me, but I would brush it off like it was nothing because I assumed that if I made it or if I seemed bothered, it would become a bigger thing than I wanted it to be. So I was like, if I just play it off, like they'll forget about it and it'll just be chill. But yeah i mean i guess now chinese is also starting to identify me because i try to speak to native speakers and they're like what are you trying to say (laughs) your tones are off i'm like i know i'm working on it (laughs) when you think about the word roots and i guess when i the first time that i asked this question the um interviewee was kind of confused i guess but i i've gotten it so much especially when i went to europe they Of course, they wouldn't say roots. They would be speaking in in German or something, but that Mm -hmm. would be the translation. They would be like, they wouldn't actually ask, like, where are you from? They would ask, like, what are your roots just directly? So um, I guess, like, how would you define that for yourself if you got that question? That's interesting because I know a lot of adoptees say that we don't have any. You know, we were taken from our family of origin and raised in a different one but I think I don't know I I feel like I do still have a strong connection with my biological family whoever they may be but I also have a really good relationship with my adoptive family and so I feel like I have roots in both and yeah it's it's kind of like a constant in between like I feel Chinese but I also feel very American at the same time and I know that both groups aren't going to fully accept me 
So I think especially for inter-country adoptees, we need to find roots in the middle somewhere and like find community there because it's hard to fit in in just one of those places, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I guess like you, you've been talking more with the, the connection between people, you know, so um, between the families, as you mentioned, um, mm-hmm. do you feel also that you are torn between like places? Um, and I think, what am I trying to get at here? Because I, I feel like, you know, when I would think about like meeting my birth parents, you know, we're always like wondering about that choice in the back of our heads if we um, mm-hmm. ever had that option, you know, um, right. I would usually say, you know, I'm not interested in the culture. I'm not interested in the place, but I'm interested in them like as people, just how they were, like, where did I get my my nose from and my eyes right. from and stuff like that. So do you feel um, more of like just the place, like the actual country? Do you feel torn between the two countries? I think yes, but only because people treat me a certain way because of my race. I think to kind of reclaim my identity and try to find connection with my biological family, I'm interested in culture and language, but ultimately it's, again, like you, the people that I care about and like the people I'm most interested in. If you would not mind expanding on it, um, what have been some stereotypes that you've had to go through as a child and also as an adult that you would like to share? Expecting me to be able to speak a certain language, but then also like in elementary school, I would try to hang out with the very few Chinese students at the school and they would tell me I wasn't Chinese because I didn't go home and speak the language and I was like well that sucks (laughs) Um, but then I guess I don't know stereotypes a lot of them have to do with adoption too and just kind of people's assumptions surrounding adoption and I would get things like oh you were just thrown in a trash can and I was like that's a terrible thing to say but kids learn it somewhere and say it so yeah stuff like that it just I I think it was hard because I was raised in a very white area and international adoption was still pretty new and so people didn't really understand what was happening and then I think the kids I went to school with would kind of hear things from their parents or interpret explanations from their parents in a totally different way and then ask me about it and I don't think they were trying to be malicious but I was like oh this question is very offensive but okay (laughs) I (laughs) it was kind of funny because the college I went to the entire like I don't know slogan whatever is about global connection and so we were a co-op school where you would go to class for six months and then you'd work for six months and get like real world experience and yeah I mean it's cool because you don't pay tuition when you're on co-op you get paid like you're actually working and you can figure out if you want to do what you think you want to do and so pretty much everybody I knew was going abroad or at least leaving the state of Massachusetts but since I'm a biology major all of the labs and all the scientists are already in Boston so I was like why would I leave like I have Harvard I have MIT there's no point in me leaving So yeah, I just stuck around. (laughs) My family, we've traveled to Europe. We traveled to Costa Rica, which is really cool. And we want to go to China, but it's, I mean, especially now we can't really travel anywhere, but you know, finding time and money to go. Cause I think if I went back to China, I'd want to go for an extended amount of time to like do the touristy stuff, but also like process my own story. And so I think that's longer than a typical vacation for me. So whenever I find the time. (laughs) I guess just in regards to the trips that you took before abroad, were, were you stereotyped? And were the stereotypes somehow different from what you got in the US? How would you define that? I don't think I was, but I think the only reason for that is because I was always with my white parents. 
and I was young. I was, I was, you know, teenager, 20s. So, and I mean, that happens here too. When I'm with my parents, I do not experience the racism and the microaggressions. And so I kind of talk about this with other adoptive parents because I don't think, especially white adoptive parents, realize that when we're with them, their whiteness is almost like caping us and it makes other people feel more comfortable around us. Or maybe they're afraid to ask the questions they do to me alone. But yeah, I think because I was always with my parents, I didn't really experience any issues. Okay. Okay. And you you were talking about being with your parents. What about just being in a group of white friends? Did you find that that sort of had the same protective, visible layer, I guess? Or? Yes, but... On the other hand, there were many times where I felt tokenized by my friends. And so, you know, I was the friend of color. I was the Asian friend. I kind of like fit that need to make the group more diverse. And so in like back then, I would kind of laugh about it. And I'd almost like play into the joke to just, you know, make it okay for me. But looking back, I'm like, oh, that was that was definitely happening. And (laughs) I don't know if I'm okay with it now, but. You know, I was 15, 16. I just wanted to fit in. (laughs) We all go through it. (laughs) Yeah, we all know. We all know. (laughs) You said you definitely felt that you didn't feel like you totally belonged when you, when they kept on saying, oh, like you got this tone and tone wrong and you're like, I'm trying. Um, And when, especially like when they, I'm sure they asked you then, like, what's, what's your background when you started talking with them? Did they were they like really surprised as in like this is like a taboo topic or were they pretty accepting that of what you were trying to do they were definitely accepting and i'm i have one really good friend who actually like tries to help me and will text me in chinese and stuff but i think the part that we don't really talk about it is we're all around the same age which means we were all born under the one child policy but I was the only one who was adopted out. And so that part we could just kind of ignore and skim over. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you've experienced it, but yeah, whenever I tell, <clears throat> excuse me, um, my Chinese colleagues and we're the same age, I'm like, oh yeah, I was adopted. It's just kind of like, oh, <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I was. <laughs> and then, then we just move on. So... The awkwardness is definitely more about the adoption aspect and not the me trying to learn the language. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hmm. Okay. I I don't know. I, I've also heard this just from word of mouth. It hasn't been anything that I've tried to do, and it's actually discouraged uh-huh. me from really learning any Asian languages because... It also seems that the world just kind of groups us into East Asians and it's only yes. just, you know, Chinese or Japanese. <laughs> um, yes. But, you know, it's it's really just totally put me off per, just personally from trying to learn one because I know that, you know, as, as language learners, it's really nice to get that confirmation from native speakers that you're making progress, that you're doing well, and... With me having a background in European languages, of course they know that I'm not from there because of how I look. Um, Mm -hmm. It's unfortunately like that, but it's also just like they they give me the confirmation that I feel like I sometimes need just as motivation or as just like, okay, like I can keep on going with this and I feel like I'm not failing and I can communicate with someone. But um, my mom actually spent two, two years, I think, in Taiwan, and she also spoke about this because... Um, I don't think these people, her, they were her colleagues as well, but I don't think they they were adopted in any form or, um, or anything like that. But something had happened and they grew up speaking, um, you know, just being raised with English and then mm-hmm. they learned Chinese. And then, of course, um, my mom was a missionary, so they were with a lot of other white missionaries. And um, I guess the reaction was sort of just like, um, well, I guess kind of a little bit like you said, like they, the people when they were in Taiwan were expecting them to be absolutely perfect. Um, 
you know, no mistakes, no accent. Um, mm -hmm. And even if they're trying and even if they've given a lot of effort, if their white friend, you know, comes up and it's clear that they don't speak as well as them because they've been learning less or um, just something like that. It's definitely uneven just for the fact that they look Asian, you know, they get put down for just trying. So, um, you know, and I, I've heard from um, one of my really good friends is in South Korea right now, and she mm -hmm. was talking sort of about, um, and I guess she was talking a little bit about how if you look Asian, you know, if, if I went to go and visit her in South Korea, then they would assume that I you know, would speak Korean, and then they would probably try Chinese if I didn't speak Korean, and then they may switch to English finally if I didn't speak Chinese. Yeah. Because um, there is a really, there was, I mean, before the virus, a really big, like, apparently tourist uh, Chinese people in, um, in South Korea. So I can understand that, but also, like, she, she kind of said along the same lines, you know, if you did learn Korean, then they would expect you to be pretty perfect, and they wouldn't give you a lot of credit for, you know, going for it, because those are not right. easy, you know? So yeah. that's that's kind of like the, the idea that I've been thinking about that is just, yeah. I will say, though, I think people forgive me a lot more than my American-born Asian friends who don't speak their heritage languages. <laughs> I don't know if it's because they're like, oh, well, you were raised by white people. You kind of have an excuse. But yeah, I found that I've I've gotten off easier for not knowing than some of my friends. So I, yeah. Do you have any closing comments or anything you want to say? I don't know. I mean, I think, I know your channel's not specifically for adoptees or anything, but if your viewers happen to be adoptees and they want to learn their heritage language, I would highly recommend it. I was really intimidated by Chinese, but it's actually a lot of fun. I mean, I enjoy learning languages already, but I think it's a lot of fun. It's not as hard as everyone says it is, like the grammar is really easy. And it's just a nice way to reconnect with where you came from, so. This concludes the end of our fourth episode in the interview series. Thank you so much for watching and tuning in, and make sure to check out Lily's channel, Lily Faye, which I will link below. We will see each other in another video. Take care.